another episode of the Discomfort Zone podcast. The idea to cross the ape man with the Anunnaki. Slaves work animals created for one person to avert the gods. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Discomfort Zone podcast. I am as always Olev and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Welcome Patient Zero and Alien Honey and of course Rondon, thank you very much for joining as always. I hope you can hear me okay. We had a few uh, scares right at the beginning of the show as always, but I think we should be up and running. And uh, what an episode we've got this week. Wow. Um, I'll tell you what, before we start, we've been covering some very big subjects over the last few episodes and unpacking quite a bit uh, as we go, and so I thought that this episode might be a good idea to review uh, some of what we've gone over. Now, we are going to introduce a new subject, but we're going to use this new subject to sort of view through that lens all of these different things that we've been talking about over the last few episodes. Ah, one more thing that I will mention as per usual. Um, This week I'm having some problems with Discord on my computer, so I'm having my chat open alongside the uh, episode, so I might miss a few things here or there, though it should show up in the uh, layout anyway, so I apologize if it takes me a while to uh, respond to some of your questions or comments. But as always, please feel free to uh, post, and uh, I will make sure to uh, look at them occasionally. But as for us, I think we are ready to uh, get started. So we've really talked about so many different uh, subjects, I feel, over the last few uh, episodes, and I've been trying to piece it all together. And as I... Oh, welcome, Crimson Clad. Thank you very much for joining. A pleasure to have you, as always. And I, as I was uh, re-listening to last week's episode, as I often do to make sure that I didn't miss anything, I uh, had mentioned this term, and uh, I usually try and define and give some sort of clear statement of what I mean when I introduce a new term, especially if it's important, and this time I somehow uh, forgot, and so I thought that this is going to be the subject of this week because it is in fact a very big Uh, subject. And I am, of course, uh, talking about harmonics, uh, harmonics, harmonies. And uh, for those uh, who saw my post on Hive, uh, harmonology, which I actually didn't know was a word. I thought I had uh, invented it. But uh, it's apparently some, you know, pseudo scientific term, very much from the New Age movement. But nonetheless, This is a subject that is tremendously important and meaningful for understanding one of the greatest uh, laws of this universe that we live in, one of the biggest underlying frameworks that helps us to see so many things in a different light. And so we'll start at what I hope will be uh, the beginning, and that is the term harmony. What does harmony actually mean, or harmonics? Well, as I sometimes do, although not always, I actually uh, looked up the Webster definition for uh, harmony. And it's a very curious word. It's actually not a very old word. It's rather recent. And the original, I thought the original was the music, and that the metaphor came later. But the original, at least from the Greek, was apparently closer to an agreement or an accord rather than something uh, to do with harmonics and scales. But nevertheless, I think most of the people that have heard of the term have heard of it more in relation to uh, music. But when I looked over the different definitions for the word uh, harmony, and I'm actually going to post that up in chat, feel free to go over it if you want, but... uh, It's not important to see all of the different definitions, but it's just curious to see how we think about this term. And one of the uh, one of the definitions that drew my eye uh, in the beginning was, if you can see in the chat, I'm not sure if you're able to see it, but uh, see the science of the structure, relation, and progression of chords. 
And apart from these last two words, this last word of uh, chords, that is uh, pretty much the exact definition that I was looking for, for what we're about to talk about today. So enough uh, jibber jabber, let's get right down to it. For those of you who have any uh, background in musical theory, this uh, will probably be quite familiar for you. Uh, for those who don't, we're going to be going over it from the beginning, the basics, and this is going to build further and further. And so, uh, actually, in chat, I had this ready, but it was on my computer, so now I have to get the uh, picture from elsewhere. Um, what I want to talk about is the basics of musical theory. And so I'm just going to uh, post a picture here, and I think you can see that in chat and in the video. This is a picture of a piano, uh, the keys of a piano. And on it are listed the uh, letters that correlate to the different musical notes. Now, we also have the uh, original, you know, the Italian, the Latin of uh, music, uh, the language of music, um, the, the names of the notes, which we probably are familiar with, mostly from uh, that, uh, the sound of music, uh, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. And so these letters uh, correlate to those names, starting from C as Do and working our way up. So C, D, E, F, G, A, B is Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti. doesn't matter to memorize exactly what, but so that we understand uh, the image that we can see before us. Now, what we have here is a lot of information condensed into this uh, very simple image. And the reason that I brought this image, I've, uh, I've picked up a few instruments over the years and every instrument has a different physicality that expresses the music. And with that, a different um, need from our body in order to produce it, whether it's a wind instrument or percussion or you know any different type of musical instruments when it's a flute you close the holes and that makes uh, the distance that the air travels longer and that changes the note but of all of the instruments that i've tried uh, so far none beats the piano in terms of its uh, simplicity and ease of understanding the real science behind it the theory of music and so that's why I want to talk a little bit about this picture. And if you're absolutely new and know nothing about music, etc., don't worry. It doesn't matter because we're going to be talking about this as an example. So what does that mean? Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. We all, I think, well, most of us have heard, I think. Some, most of us can recite it. Some of us can probably even sing. Um, but what is it? Well, the easiest way to answer that if we ask the child, for example, would be, it sort of sounds good. If you hear someone playing any instrument and it sounds like they're playing the wrong notes, that usually means that it sounds bad to us. Obviously, this is to a certain degree subjective. And yet, um, there is a profession, which is a uh, tuner, a piano tuner, and he comes and tunes the piano exactly. And if a piano isn't tuned, then it doesn't sound as good doesn't matter if you're playing jazz, blues, or classical music, there is something very basic, uh, inherent, seems to be absolutely born in us, this ability to categorize music as good and pleasant versus unpleasant. And this really, at its most basic core, is what harmonies are. If we had to put the most basic definition that we could without using any other terms, we would say that harmonies or harmony is what sounds good and disharmony is what doesn't sound good or what sounds bad. Now, why are we talking about all this? Well, bear with me and we will get there in the end. I hope we're going to be uh, connecting all of these dots eventually. But for now, let's talk a little bit about these uh, seven or eight, depending on how you count it, uh, notes. Once again, we come to that special number, number seven. And again, the eighth is what we mentioned, the octave. So we have these seven different uh, letters, these seven different notes. And at the end of that cycle of seven begins a new note, which is an octave higher. 
and we can see that it's represented by the same letter. So do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, c, d, e, f, g, a, b, c. What is the difference between that first do and that second do, that first C and that second C? If you know a little bit about musical theory, um, you might know what an octave sounds like. It's a very peculiar thing to explain. I should actually have... You know what? Give me a moment. Let's try something. Since I'm here in my uh, different room, I actually have my guitar on hand. So let's listen very quickly to what... Ooh, sorry, to what an octave <laughs> sounds like. I'm just going to place my uh, microphone so you can hear. So this is a low note. This is actually E. Let's try that again. Okay. And this is an octave higher. So, ooh, sorry about that. So, I hope with that demonstration, I somewhat proved my point there is something to be said about that note being the same note. The low uh, E, Mi, and the high E are the same note an octave apart. And I've, I've thought about this a long time and I cannot understand any better way to describe it with words. So if you still don't quite get it, that's okay. And I think some people have less of an ear to sort of hear different uh, musical sounds, so don't worry about it. If you understand what I'm talking about, that's fine. But what we need to understand is that a new octave is not just a new set of notes, but it is the same set of notes repeated at a higher octave, at a higher frequency. And this is where we start to enter the world of harmonies. Harmonies in a very uh, scientific sense are the mathematical laws that govern um, these relationships that sound good between different notes. Oop. Hang on, sorry about that. Can you hear me still? Yes, my sound card just fell. <laughs> sorry about that. So I can see, oh, I can see in chat for some reason my chat. Uh, has stopped updating on my computer. I'm not sure why. So I didn't actually catch the people had, had uh, commented. So let's see. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, the notes sing together. Yes. Okay. You <laughs> um, excellent. Okay. So I can see in chat I've missed too much. I wonder why the on-screen chat isn't working. Never mind. We will continue. So when we talk about a different octave, we actually beginning a new cycle of the same songs and the relationship between an octave is exactly uh, let's say double or half and what I mean by that is that it's double the frequency and half the length so when we're talking about an octave we can actually talk not only in notes but in frequencies as well and each of these notes has a certain frequency that's connected to it. Now, for example, we can say that A, um, the second A that we see, is 440 hertz. Now, if we know that it's 440 hertz, we immediately know that an octave higher would be double that in frequency, and an octave lower would be half of that in frequency. So what we need to understand here is there is a mathematical relationship between these different notes that is expressed in uh, exact um, fractions, okay? And this was actually first spoken of by, uh, in Western culture by Aristotle who discovered this. He took a uh, piece of string, I believe, and he saw that when he plucked the string at full length, it emitted a certain note, and when he pressed down the string at the exact midpoint and split the string as it were to half its length, the note was exactly a, an octave higher. And he found that the same was true with the uh, one-fifth, uh, two-thirds, and I actually can't remember the rest of the fractions, but there's a whole list if you want to look for it for each um, distance between two notes and distance between two frequencies that are harmonious there is a certain fraction that governs that relationship. So what do we mean when I say that are harmonious? 
Well, when we talk about these seven notes, uh, C to B, we're actually talking about notes that are tuned together. And that means that their frequencies are in tune with each other. So if we took a piano and one of these notes, let's say E, was out of tune, wasn't the exact right note that's supposed to be there, it would sound off and it wouldn't be harmonious, meaning the fraction between that note and the other notes wouldn't be an exact fraction. The harmony between the frequencies wouldn't be mathematically correct. So when we look at the piano keyboard scale, we actually see a set of rules, a pattern, as it were. And I think, as well, as we've established, when we talk about this scale, which is the seven notes that we've spoken of, uh, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, that's actually one specific scale. And if we want to see, we can see on the keyboard that that consists of all of the white keys on the keyboard. However, we have uh, five more black keys that are unaccounted for, that we haven't really mentioned. And they also fit into this whole theory of harmonies and frequencies. So we'll talk a little bit about that now. Uh, so far, do we have any questions? Do we have any people who the music jargon is a bit too much or need me to go over anything? Please let me know in chat. Is there anyone here as well? Oh, I can see a few people have joined. Uh, Darius Go, thank you very much for joining. I think it's the first time I've seen you here. Welcome. And if not, I apologize. But for now, we will continue. So we have these seven notes, which are f different frequencies with a set relationship, mathematical relationship between them. And in fact, this is what I mean. This is what is meant by tuning. When a piano tuner comes to a piano to tune it, he is changing the strings so that the frequency that they emit will fall into this mathematical pattern. And what's curious is that he doesn't measure the frequency as an electrician, but he actually listens to the frequency, for, sorry, to the frequency and his ears can detect if it's the right note or the wrong note. So that's already a very curious thing. Why is it that, let's say, unlike um, if we took an example from other senses, let's say colors, we can look and say, oh, these colors don't go together and these colors do. But it would be hard to really categorize the exact color. And when we talk about companion colors or, you know, opposite colors, etc., it doesn't seem to be as intuitive um, and as easily biologically detected as it uh, is more so with machines and indeed when anyone is working with colors at a precise level you usually have some kind of machine measuring the you know RGB value or whatever values you're talking about empirically but not with musicians and when it comes to musicians um, they rely entirely on their ear they might tune their instruments but nonetheless they can hear when something is right or wrong. Most of them, I'd say, maybe. Um, with painters, obviously, they look at the colors and decide what's the color that they want, but it's a much less rigid system. Uh, the, the tuning of an instrument is a precise empirical science which is tested and done, or can be, through the ear. Sorry about that. Through the ears. So it's a very curious example, and we'll get back to why that's uh, important. But I've mentioned now that there are these seven notes, and we've spoken about the number seven. The seven notes and the seven frequencies and the seven harmonies uh, that all go along with them are, in fact, another representation of that number seven that we've spoken about. And for those of you with a keen eye, you may have noticed that if we add the five black notes uh, to the seven white notes, we actually get 12 different notes. And this 12 also correlates to the 12 that we were talking about in the same way that the chakra system has a system of 12 and the planets have 12 planets. So again, with music, we have a system of seven and a companion system of 12. And these two systems have a name. In fact, they're quite well recognized in the musical world. 
the scale that we all know about, the seven note scales that we all learn to sing, is called the pentatonic scale. The major scale is probably more common a name. The 12 note scale is called a chromatic scale. And we sort of have a different uh, lettering for those notes, those black notes in between. And they are actually designated by their relationship to the white notes. So we have C sharp, which is the first black note after the C. And we have D sharp and we have F sharp, but there is no E sharp because there's no black note between E and F. And then we also have the black note beneath or before one of the notes, which is flat. So we have B flat, we have A flat, we have G flat, but we don't have a C flat. That's just so that we're all clear about what I mean. If you're just listening to this, don't worry about it, but we have a designation for the 12 note scale which is in relation to the seven notes that we were talking about and always in relation to it. So the the two scales here are very much interconnected and sort of are different systems once again for achieving uh, the same thing, whether it be music or something else. So what does all this have to do with anything? And why are we delving into musical theory when we're clearly supposed to be talking about spirituality and human consciousness? Well, the reason, firstly, is that Drumvalo Melchizedek uh, felt it absolutely necessary in his book, and he goes quite deeply into this subject of musical theory and the seven-note scales, because for him it's uh, a very good example and a key example for understanding all of these different subjects. So let's go into that a little bit now and we'll see how this all ties together. We started off by talking about harmonies. Now, there is a term which is the composing of harmonies called harmonics, which would be the study of the different harmonies in music. So for example, if I played the note C, I could instantly know that the notes E and G would sound very good with it. Whereas if I were playing the note C sharp, the first black note along with C, it wouldn't sound very good. So there are basic harmonies which we can, um, which what musicians do, basically write new harmonies, compose them, try and discover, and harmonics is the study of that. However, harmonology is the study of the law of harmony that seems to play a very big part in our universe. Um, very good comment, Alien Hand. Alien Hand says there's a popular theory that the pyramids were designed to create healing frequencies, and we're going to talk more about healing frequencies later in the show. But excellent comment, yes. In fact, uh, okay, we'll, we'll get into all that very soon. <laughs> but for now, I want to talk about uh, something else that might be a little off topic, um, but I think it's worth mentioning. Perhaps some of you have heard of a very famous uh, theory and system that seems to be prevalent today, which is the law of attraction. And I feel it's important to mention this because I would like to give my two cents about it since it's so popular and I don't think it should be discredited. However, I think there are some things that are worth knowing uh, as well. For those who've never heard of it, the law of attraction basically states that if you put your will and intention towards something, it will come true. And basically, if you if it hasn't come true, that's that's because you have not put enough will and intention towards it. That's a very oversimplified statement, but from what I've seen and from what I've read and heard, that's basically the gist of it. And it sort of comes down to making this board, this vision board that you put up pictures of what you want and little quotes. And as long as you're focused on that car or that house, you will eventually get it. Now, the thing about the law of attraction is that it has a half truth. And that is, if you pull your will and intention towards something, that does greatly increase uh, the chances of that thing happening. However, as we probably all know, uh, there are some things that even with all the will in the world, it seems that we find it very hard to change. 
And so this paradox is really key, I think, another one of those paradoxes. And this is what harmonies, harmonics, harmonology is all about. I'm not sure what term would be best suited, um, but the law of harmonies, let's call it. From what I've said so far, from what we know from music and from what we've spoken about, harmonies are two different frequencies that are related in a positive way that can converge because of the similarity in their actual frequency. Not the same frequency, but similarity uh, mathematically. So a double, for example, um, if you have a beat that's one half and one double, they will share every other beat. And so there's a correlation between those two. It's sort of the same thing fre with frequencies. Frequencies are beats, are pulses. And if you have two pulses that are similar enough that their different beats converge, even occasionally, they will have a certain harmony to them. Now that harmony isn't necessarily only musical, but this same basic law principle of harmonies and frequencies is true of all harmonies and frequencies uh, that, we, that we've talked about. And so if we'll recall just a few of them uh, very quickly, um, we've spoken about various subjects here and one of the big ones was of course the chakras. The chakra system as we've mentioned, these vortices of energy that are swirl swirling and seven of them and each of them in a different frequency and a different color. Well, the way or one of the ways that those chakras interact with our environment is through the laws of frequencies. And so if you've heard about the different sounds of each chakra or different colors that you can wear to uh, open a certain chakra, this is based off of the laws of harmonies. When you wear that color, that means that there is a certain frequency of light which is emitted. And even if that frequency of light is not the same as the frequency of the chakra, it is harmonious with the frequency of the chakra. And that is how it can encourage the chakra to open or to change. Uh, so the law of harmony at work is what connects our chakra system to our physical environment outside. Not only that, but if we have our brains emitting a certain frequency, our hearts electrically and electromagnetically emitting a certain frequency, those different frequencies are also interconnecting with the different frequencies of the chakras and the harmonies and disharmonies between them are affecting each other all the time. So if we look at this once again, um, if we're taking the different levels of uh, our being, the physical, the emotional, the mental and the spiritual, once again each of those will be different frequencies which are operating at very, very different spectrums, one of them on a physical level, one of them on a mental level, one of them on an emotional level, but all of those frequencies still have a harmonious relationship between them. And when we feel that one part isn't aligned with the other, that is another uh, example and expression of that disharmony. Now, I'm not saying that everything is you know, harmonies and disharmonies. I'm saying that everything has an expression as a harmonious or disharmonious relationship. So once again, this is not the absolute answer. This is a lens through which we can view these different things. And what's nice about this lens is that it's both a very scientific lens and at the same time we can feel, we can hear um, this law very clearly and emotionally and intuitively with our uh, right hemisphere. So, um, there's obviously a lot more to talk about the chakra system in terms of frequencies, but we can carry on t um, seeing how this law of harmony relates to every expression of frequencies that we've spoken about. So once again, uh, I think it, yeah, it was last episode, somebody asked, how can it be that these small waves from planets can affect human life? And indeed, when we spoke of the Schumann resonance, how is it that 
uh, the Schumann resonance has any kind of effect on us. Again, that's the law of harmonies. That's the resonance that the earth is emanating is obviously very powerful and it is aligning our frequencies to it in one way or another. So when we have a frequency in our mind, in our heart, which is harmonious with the Schumann resonance, we actually become healthier and feel better and vice versa. Now I just let it slip <laughs> another small uh, part of this which we can talk about is not only are there these constant harmonies where one frequency is harmonious to the other but if there is a strong enough uh, frequency, a powerful enough signal it can actually change uh, the frequencies of something else through the law of harmony. So if you'll imagine, it's sort of like beating uh, at a certain beat. And if you, you know, hit it, if you beat it hard enough, it will eventually fall into rhythm with the rest. So you have two different signals. Uh, one is very strong, one is very weak. And assuming that it, it's, uh, it can be changed, the, the frequency can change, if the strong signal continues for long enough, it will actually carry along uh, the other frequency with it and, uh, and uh, activate it, as it were. So a very simple example of this would be the very uh, cartoonish uh, display of opera singers where they can smash a glass with their voice, with their vocal cords. Um, the way this scientifically happens is that their voice is resonating at a specific frequency and that's the specific frequency of the glass that they're trying to shatter. And at this point, because they've hit the correct uh, frequency, it vibrates the actual glass. And since glass is so brittle, the vibration eventually causes it to shatter. So in this situation, a strong enough signal from the outside manages to move a physical object, uh, obviously, to that frequency. And because of the structure, that specific frequency is what causes it eventually to shatter. Uh, very unimportant side note, Tesla actually invented a curious little device that could be attached to any building and it would start sending these impulses and eventually it would vibrate the whole building until it found the correct frequency and it could topple uh, any building that it was connected to. So once again, these are all the same, uh, these are all different examples of the same law at work here. Okay, uh, I can see that in chat there's a lot <laughs> going on that I've missed. I might have gone to a little bit too much of a rant, but we'll try and uh, go through it and see. Um, ah, yes, Alien Honey, binaural stuff again. Binaural stuff, another example. For those who've never heard of it, there are, I won't go into everything uh, how it works, but basically, if you listen to a certain frequency, it will eventually, it's called in train but change your brain's frequency uh, to that frequency. A word of warning, uh, I personally had an experience where I was using it um, to increase my alpha waves, I was using it for studying, and I took it too far, and it was a very uh, interesting experience, nothing too serious, but I started feeling unhealthy, tired, irritable, um, not able to rest as it were and sort of off balance and it, it took me a while to realize that it was I was using this for hours and hours every day and it was just not letting my brain naturally uh, change its uh, frequency so definitely interesting to test and to check it out you know there are some of these binaural beats that are supposed to be effects like uh, drugs you know it's a fun little thing to try but do be careful with uh, changing your brain's frequencies um let's see du -du -du. <laughs> oh thank you cherry yes i <laughs> okay i'm sorry i'm just going through chat to see a lot of mentions of my uh, voice which are not uh, important i think for the general public okay the Schumann resonance is 33 hertz. I think it's actually less. I believe that 33 hertz is a, again, is a harmony of the Schumann resonance. Yes, 7.83 hertz. Well done. And the human delta wave, if I'm not mistaken, is also 7, 
7.5, I think, but close to uh, that uh, resonance as well. Okay. I think we're okay and there are no crucial questions. So we will continue. Uh, if you have anything, then please do post and I will try. I have to see why this isn't working. Anyway, so we're talking a little bit about um, what we've been going over the last few episodes. And I think it's just very useful to mention what we talked about astrology, the planets. Um, once again, if every shape has a certain frequency that is caused by that shape, by that form, then every shape is in an interaction, a harmonious or disharmonious relationship with the other objects around and indeed with the different frequencies that are around us. And so once again, when we revisit the theory of astrology whereby we have our natural biological frequencies, our heart emanates one frequency, our brain emanates another, our chakra system is at another, all of these different systems are coming into contact with waves of different frequencies from these different planets. And according to those different frequencies, and again, the different angles that they hit us at, that will decide, based on harmonious and disharmonious relationships, what effect those planets will have uh, on us and on the planet in general. So once again, to sort of see how the science behind astrology is all boiled down to a very crucial and simple law um, that exists and prevails around everything. Now, a small little example, uh, which I did want to mention just because it's curious, and if you hadn't heard of it, I thought it would be interesting, was the Rife machine. Now, I have to be honest that uh, I only... Uh, recalled that it's called the Rife Machine when I was researching it for the uh, episode, but I did read in a book many, many years ago, The Secret Life of Plants, I think it was called, and it's the sort of third book that they published, the one where all of the crazy stories and theories that no one would ever believe, so that's where they stuck them all. And it mentioned this scientist, Rife, who discovered that different viruses have a certain frequency which is correlated to their shape, to their form, once again. So we know this already. And he discovered that when the body is given a certain uh, magnetic impulse, a certain electromagnetic frequency, if you tune that frequency to the exact frequency of the virus, it's capable of basically shattering the cellular structure and killing off just the virus without harming any of the rest of the body. So if you've heard about this, I think it was semi-famous back, uh, back in the day. Um, this is a very good example of the laws of harmonies. And in this case, um, the harmony is actually used to destroy the virus and cure the person. But again, it's this rule, this law of thumb, that when you have a certain signal, which is strong enough, it can uh, change the frequency of the environment around it. And this is where I think the law of the attraction is very important to, uh, to talk about, basically. Oh, you have an app that's meant to be a virtual Rife machine. Wow, that sounds very interesting. Uh, oh, nice. I am uh, Z-App. I'm going to look into that later, Alien Honey. Thank you very much for sharing. I thought someone here might have, uh, will probably have heard of, uh, <laughs> of the Rife Machine. It's very interesting just because of all of the, you know, quirky and, uh, you know, a, a little out there <laughs> scientists and people that there are and that I mentioned on the show. Rife has so many scientific studies behind him. And I think since then, a lot of people have replicated his uh, studies and experiments as well. So it's very interesting. If you've never heard of it, you should really uh, check it out. So the law of attraction. Now I'm not here to knock the law of attraction or anything else. I would just like for us all to understand things better, myself included, of course. And so the law of attraction, as we mentioned, holds this semi-paradox where what they're promising is not something that they seem to be able to deliver always. And they have a very 
a convenient caveat, which is if it doesn't work for you, that's because you're not trying hard enough or you haven't waited long enough, etc., etc. Now, I'm not saying that they're bad people. And in fact, I know uh, this is a wonderful introduction to the law of harmony, to understanding ourselves, people who believe that they are fated in one way or another, to be empowered, to believe that they can change their fate, that they can change their lives, and that they really need to start by believing, is a wonderful message that I completely get behind, and it's true. However, there is a other side to it, and the reason that the law of attraction works, or what the law of attraction is actually describing, is one half of the law of harmonies in action, meaning we are constantly bombarded by all of these signals, both physical and non-physical. Um, we can see it to a certain degree with cultural, uh, dare I say, memes, but different information, different uh, data that reaches us, that affects our psyche, our behavior, even our identity at times. We can see how we are creatures that are constantly inundated with so much information. And of that, most of it goes uninterpreted. Most of it doesn't even enter or, as it were, it passes through. And only a very, very f small fraction of that actually gets inside and then processed and then understood and then brought to our awareness and then sort of can be thought about. So what is it that governs uh, this information? What, how do we decide what I hear about? As a small example, why is it that the people who are listening to this show are listening to it now and not anyone else? And part of the reason for that is that we have this uh, built-in system, the system of harmony, which is the frequencies that I am emanating in, the frequencies that make up my being, all of those frequencies that we were talking about, are somewhat of a guide as to what I will be, quote-unquote, attracting in my life. And if we think about it in a real-world example, uh, we obviously wouldn't have called it this before, but a very simple example, I think, would be if we are unhappy or if we are cheerful. I'm sure all of you have noticed that when you smile, people tend to smile at you more. And if you're grumpy, people tend to be grumpy more. And if you're impolite, people usually return the favor. This is, of course, because human beings are very much inclined to mirror our environment. But even more so, I would say, this goes beyond just our close social environment. This seems to be a very natural effect whereby I both experience the world in the sense that I, in the, in the worldview that I have, in the way that I see it, and that interpretation in turn influences my worldview. And so, to put it very, very basically, even though we can all change our opinion and our worldview on anything. It's within our power. Nobody is incapable. Well, let's say nobody, but nobody healthy is incapable of changing their mind. Nevertheless, we see a very strong tendency to stay in the same worldview. And that makes a lot of sense since it's the one that we stick with for the longest period of time. So when we have this part in ourselves. Let's take a very serious uh, example for one moment. And in fact, let me talk from personal experience because I think that would be best. Um, as most of my listeners will know by now, in my past, I have had uh, severe bouts of depression when I was uh, quite um, younger than I am today. And depression is a very unique, I would say, affliction. It's not like anxiety or even rage. Um, it, there's something very, very hopeless about it. It's very often it was apathetic. I didn't feel sad because to feel sad would be an emotion. I felt nothing, which is sort of even lacking in motivation. And in those times of despair when I really couldn't see much point to anything, I really felt that the world was in despair with me. And, and in a way, it was. Obviously, I'm assuming that there were people who were smiling around me and people who were, you know, happy, etc. But I wasn't getting that information. 
And if we're going to structure that sentence according to this show, the frequency that I was emanating at was disharmonious to that frequency of happiness, and therefore there was no convergence, there was no relationship, it just passed through. Whereas those frequencies that, shall I say, were darker, were more hopeless, were more related to what I was feeling, I was getting them on a much stronger signal, and they were converging, as it were, with me. And with time, as you know, I progressed and managed to work my way out of it, and let's say today, the world I'm living in today is a much happier world, even though, you know, that's not the external world that has changed. That's both my worldview and the way I feel and my biochemistry, etc., etc. But it's also, you know, one of the representations of that is my base frequency or the frequencies that my biological body is operating on have changed. And so those frequencies are now harmonious with different frequencies which come and converge with who I am today. So, okay, let's take a moment. <laughs> I feel that was a lot to unpack. I hope that was more or less uh, understandable. Um, oh, thank you very much, Dynamic. I can see, oh, wow, lots of people in chat. Dynamic Green TK, thank you very much for joining First Amendment Lax, Polar Maestro, and Cheery. Cheery or Cherry? Thank you very much all for being here. Um, if you have any questions about what I've just said or about the laws of harmonics, let me know. As for me, there was one more thing that I did want to mention. Um, I think we have time for it, right? Ten minutes? Yeah, that should be enough to unpack another one. Um, oh, all the time. Um, let's see. Oh, thank you so much. Dynamic Green TK, it's a pleasure to have you here. We're here every week, so uh, you're more than welcome to join whenever you want. This is usually the, the, the nonsense that I waffle about for an hour, so I hope you enjoy. Um, the last subject that I wanted to touch on was uh, the frequency 432 hertz. Now, I'm assuming that in chat, at least, uh, some people have heard of this frequency. It's become much more famous in uh, recent years. And it's a very interesting story, let's say. So, we're going to touch back on musical theory just for a moment here, um, because it is important. I, when I was stating before, I said that the note A, which correlates to La, is at 440 hertz. And that's because that is the standard tuning for musical instruments today. So let's understand what this means. When we say do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, I could play any number of notes. And I could call the first one do. And then as I progress up the scale, I can relate all of the other notes to that. And it would work. And if I were to sing a song in a certain scale, you wouldn't tell the difference. But... Let's say with the frequencies, if I change that frequency of A from 440 to, let's say, 432, then all of the other notes change in relation to that one. So when we say 440 hertz, this isn't one single note. This is a key for you know, decrypting, as it were, for understanding the placement of every other note on the scale in relation to that. So when we talk about the chromatic scale and playing wrong notes when you play piano, that's a very different kind of wrong note because all of the notes on a piano are in that 12-note system, the chromatic scale. All of those notes are already tuned to one another. When we talk about something that's out of tune, um, when musicians can hear it, etc. That's again talking about going out of tune to a certain degree, enough so that you can actually hear it. When we mention 440 hertz versus, you know, um, 8 hertz, yes, less, that's a very, very small incremental change, so small that most people, musicians included, wouldn't be able to detect it with their ears. And so, what does this mean? This means that, according to uh, the sources that I believe, at some point in history, the musical notes were changed 
from whatever frequency they were before. Um, it's mentioned that it was 432, but I'm not sh entirely sure of that, to the frequency it's at today, which is 440 hertz. Now, what does this have to do with us? Well, if you are into uh, any of these uh, <laughs> conspiracy theories, etc., you might be interested to know that the frequencies have, as we said, a relationship to our biological body. And indeed, whenever we talk about harmonious and disharmonious frequencies, what we could replace that word with when it comes to our bodies is healthy and unhealthy or sick or diseased. Um, when a frequency is harmonious with our natural biological basic frequencies, it will be healthy. And vice versa, when it's disharmonious, it will be unhealthy. So, when we change the frequencies from 440 hertz to 432 hertz, we are changing the frequencies that are going to be interacting with our body. And this is a pretty big subject. Oh, I can see that Alien Honey says, I'm not sure who that is, Joe, oh, come on, I can't read these names, Joe Akabra Rav. I would imagine. Uh, did they make a post on 432? So if you're on Hive, make sure you go and check that out. I'm sure I will. This is a very, very small, uh, just notice if you've heard of it, because 432 is a very, very big example of the law of harmonies and frequencies and how they relate. So yes, there's a lot more information in general. If you haven't heard of any of this, please do check it out afterwards, because it'll be worth it. It's very interesting. Um, Oh, let's see. Patient Zero is uploaded here. The decision to standardize A at 440 hertz gained momentum in the U.S. during the early 20th century. Um, most of the U.S. music industry had switched to 440 hertz by the mid-20s. Now, I'm, I'm not going to say, you know, why specifically or what. What I am going to say is that we do know that the frequency of 432 hertz is a more harmonious frequency with our biological bodies. It doesn't matter whether it was a malicious intent that was uh, decided or whether it was simply ignorance. The fact of the matter is that scientifically speaking, because again, we're talking about frequencies, we're talking about empiricism, this can all be measured. We know for a fact that 440 hertz is more disharmonious um, to our being, to our physical, at least, being. And if you remember from last episode as well, we mentioned electromagnetic radiation and the um, possible problems that it could pose. There is a wonderful uh, electrical engineer, mad scientist, genius, called uh, Eric P. Dollard, EPD. You should check him out if you've never heard of him. I think I've mentioned him before. Uh, he is my electricity guys. He's like the Tesla 2.0. Anyway, he has done a lot of research into this subject. He is an amazing person. He's done a lot of research into church organs and the way that church organs were actually structured. They were designed and built as part of the church, the building itself, and the uh, listeners, the congregation as it were, the people who came to listen, were sat in a specific room so that the frequencies that were passing through the air because of the organ were actually converging on that specific place and the interaction between those frequencies was causing a massive either uh, both healing uh, beneficial effect and or a you know spiritual uh, out of the ordinary experience that could be induced by that which uh, I'll just mention that that technique of using frequencies to induce an altered state of consciousness is one of the most prevalent uh, techniques used as I'm assuming most of us know um, when it comes to shamanism and the shamanic practice, nearly all shamanic practices have some form of musical instrument and at least a percussion, if not a drum. And that's always used for a very, very simple beat and a very, very constant beat. And if you take a simple and constant beat, what you have is a frequency. So once again, these are techniques that are utilizing that same law of 
having a strong enough signal with a frequency that will impact uh, either just our brain signals or invariously most of our biology's different signals to be uh, in harmony with that stronger signal and with that to induce some form of change whether it's healing whether it's a different state of consciousness etc etc um yeah <laughs> yes take a little bit more than that i think patient zero um each new emperor in ancient china would slightly retune all instruments in the kingdom but maybe just for certain but it's interesting i'd never heard of that thank you i'm gonna check that out i'm i'm very interested in the chinese culture yes i should mention although i've spoken a few times about the scientific uh, pract um, exact empirical side of things, there are many, many different theories about frequencies, about which frequencies are harmonious with which parts of us, etc. This isn't, um, you know, not all of the information that you will come across will be congruent and will uh, uh, be exactly as I've said. I'm trying to give a more general picture of this law, an idea of a way to view the world as usual and the different examples are just that whatever example suits you and uh, sounds best to you then that's the one you should definitely uh, stick with but if you look in your own lives as well and i feel at least um, this viewpoint of not just saying hmm I'm really pissed off right now and my brain is searching you know for a reason for why I'm pissed off and so I think you know I'm going to find a reason, a rational reason that I can pin this on and that is going to be the reason why I'm angry. So occasionally we'll, you know, even I will. I wake up in the morning and I'm already pissed off. It could be a dream that I've had, but sometimes it's not even a dream that I remember. And then the first thing that will trigger me, I'll decide that that's what's pissed me off. And this is a lie that I tell myself that really is you know something i believe i don't know that i'm doing this i'm not aware of it i actually feel oh this is what's pissed me off now whatever it is but as is as could very well be the case there could be you know that part inside of me which was already emanating on that frequency which has attracted as it were this negativity this anger this emotion to me and now i am dealing with the outcome of that uh, convergence of harmonies. So what I started to say about the law of attraction, although there is obviously this very powerful law that with intention and will we can call, we can attract the things that we want, but equally and at the same time, there is a strong emanating force um, where we are attracting anything that is harmonious with our frequencies, positive or negative. Um, you know, why do I always attract those kind of people or whatever it is? So it is very much a two-sided coin. And that's really what I want to do, say about the law of attraction, that there is this other side as well, which is equally valid, which is the other half of the uh, law of harmonies. Um, okay, let's see. We are very close to finishing. I'm going to try and get it <laughs> on time this uh, week. Uh, in chat, is there anything that I have missed? I don't think so. Um, coincidentally, around the same time, the world's first telecommunications network. Ah, yes, I started by talking, sorry, the last few seconds about Eric Dollard. He mentions that our whole electrical system is actually designed with disharmonious frequencies to our biology. So, you know what, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that next week, because now I think we've run out of time. It's been a pleasure as always. Thank you so much to everyone who is listening live, and to all of you who are listening afterwards. Um, I've been Olev. Thank you very much for joining me, and I uh, hope to see you next week. Until then, have a good one. Mm -hmm.